In fiction, where pirates are known to be bad, bad dog. amusing, <laughs> or very bad, survive the experience. This too was something less than the truth. Everyone is clearly aware that they are the baddies. Pirates are fun. I didn't say we weren't fun, but fun or not, pirates are still the baddies. Good old chaotic neutral characters. Whereas smugglers. You were a pirate once. No, I was never a pirate. I was a smuggler. What's the difference? Well, if you're a famous smuggler, you're not doing it right. Even though they break the law and are from the same alignment, the anti-heroes held close to our hearts. People we'd almost like to be. Everything you've heard about me is true. Smugglers are often portrayed as lovable, endearing rogues whose wisdom and skill is remarkable. Jump in the hold for a month. I love my captain. Providing an essential service to society. Experts at crossing borders without detection, transferring contraband and secrets. I'm just a gringo who always delivers. One man who certainly fitted this role was called Lancelot Slee, or Lanty for short. He was a smuggling legend of the English Lake District, a quarryman and farmer on all the record sheets, but by night he was an elusive Robin Hood-style rogue who hid high in the mountains to distill bog water moonshine, which he smuggled out to his customers whilst avoiding the authorities. However, Lanty was always one step ahead of them. He was the Walter White of his day. Slee, in Old English, actually means sly or cunning, and Lanty certainly lived up to his name. He used ingenious methods of misdirection and deception, like pig's bladders, to transport his moonshine, which is the origin of the phrase having a skinful, or saying, I am bladdered. His pack horses had shoes of velvet lined with straw to minimize the sound they made when trekking over high mountain passes on secret routes to nearby ports. He invented a way of emitting steam from his still from a hedge several yards from his hideout. He had a faithful dog that alerted him to a customs patrol on more than one occasion, and he had the generous support from all of the locals, one of whom was the local magistrate, so it must have been good stuff he was making. The password to get some was to ask Lanty if he had a good crop of taties that year. Potatoes are one of the staple requirements to his moonshine, so if it all gone well, he would happily sell them some at ten shillings per gallon. He always had some moonshine with him, and he was happy to share it with those he met on his travels, which made him welcome in most places. He even managed to smuggle some into court on one of the occasions he was caught, and had the audacity to offer some to the judge, gaining him public notoriety. Using his local knowledge and skills as a quarryman, he was able to find old mines, or in some cases he actually chiselled out his own little hideout from which he could distill or store his moonshine. Since the secrets of these hideouts were lost with him when he died on May 21st, 1878, rumours of a secret stash of forgotten whiskey permeate the local pubs and any time somebody finds a bit of metal down an old mine shaft, it automatically becomes one of Lanty's hiding spots. It was during a research expedition in a local pub, one of the regulars stated, but nobody knows this for certain. And that got me thinking. Everything that we know about Lanty is hearsay. Very little is written down or provable. The mountains are so well travelled now, you'd expect any hiding spot had long since been discovered, or more than likely, obliterated in the name of health and safety. 
Well-known authors like Harry Griffin and Alfred Wainwright have both described finding remnants of Lanty stills in remote caves and high places, but that was back in the 80s and the 50s respectively. These caves have long since been filled in or collapsed over time. However, that's not stopped me looking for more of them. It's a fun hobby that gets me out into these wonderful mountains which inspired Tolkien to make Mordor. Besides zigzagging across fells, poking my nose into every hole in the ground I find, and sleeping out overnight to catch the sunrise, eventually I was lucky enough to piece together the clues and triangulate one of Lanty's hiding spots. However, there are a number of things that hindered me in this process, beyond the torrential rain, blistering heat and rugged terrain of the Lake District. First, the location. Little Langdale is the tertiary adjunct meeting spot of three old English counties, one of which no longer exists, Cumberland, Westmoreland and Lancashire. So the records for these old counties are stored in four different locations way apart from each other. Even the regular go-to tool of the internet has proven unreliable, as local knowledge for these areas isn't online in most cases. Also, from 1800 to 1865, Little Langdale, where Lanty did most of his work, was not even shown on the map. Huge swathes of mountains were omitted from this map. Even when the Ordnance Survey arrived in Little Langdale in 1865, somehow the house that Lanty built in 1840, Greenbank Farm, 25 years prior, didn't end up on that map either. What better place to set up a smuggling operation than somewhere that was off the map? Second, records have sadly been lost. Apparently, there used to be a play about Lantisley, but nobody knows anything about it anymore or has a script for it. Whilst Cumbria County Archive Service have been fantastic, there are sadly omissions to their libraries, which is understandable knowing that the records are from three other counties over 200 years ago. However, without their assistance, we would never have found Lanty's cave. Third, the legends that have been built up over the years may have been embellished a little bit to boost tourism. Not that it needs it now. Boatmen on Windermere in 1903 invented fictitious creatures for tourists to hunt called tizzywizzies. A local pub landlord, Old Will Ritson, had such tall stories he was renowned for it, and the pub now hold annual competitions to recount tall stories. Then there are great poets and writers like Wordsworth and Coleridge who found creative inspiration here, as well as Tolkien for his stories and Beatrix Potter for hers. So there's obviously something in the water here, or the spirit of the land, to encourage people to fantastical creativity. Lanty was certainly a person, but his legends may be an amalgamation of several smugglers from across the centuries of Lakeland. He was certainly not one of the first, but he may have been the most memorable. Fourth, the Lake District has to some degree been sanitised for human consumption. Most of the old mines have been deliberately collapsed, and areas cordoned off with the ubiquitous to the region dry stone walls to keep livestock in and predators and humans out. So it can be precarious, time-consuming and physically challenging to go find these places. However, we have been assisted by the invention of drones, so thanks very much, Ted. Two things have kept me going all these years. The old guy in the pub who said, but nobody knows this for certain, I wanted to be certain. And second, the discovery in 2005 by Guy Proctor and Jeremy Ashcroft of Trail Magazine. They found a high smuggling hut on the north flanks of Great Gable, on one of the well-known smuggling routes across the mountains, and a hut that had previously been dismissed from existence by the aforementioned well-known authors Harry Griffin and Alfred Wainwright. However, Guy and Jeremy's persistence and skill at climbing helped them find this precarious dwelling perched halfway up a rock face that had been built by smugglers and used to hide their contraband from the law. So it was still possible to find forgotten gems of Lake District knowledge high in the mountains. So I kept digging, exploring and researching in the local pubs. Whiskey research. Then, one day, we found this in the Cumbrian County Archives. It's a newspaper article written in 1853, which describes the location and description of one of Lanty's secret hideaways and the method of its disguise, after he was arrested and charged in 1853 for illegal distillation. 
we know from the 1851 census that Lanty and his family were living here at Arnside Farm, which is why he was accused of being complicit in this cave's disguise and operation to make the moonshine whiskey that was found there. The judge reasoned that nobody could live so close and not know about it. However, this was not an accidental, fortuitous discovery for the excise man known as Mr. Bowden. The information was passed to him by one of Lanty's accomplices after an argument over the business. Mr. William Pattinson told Mr. Bowden about this cave and may have even guided him to it. Even though Lanty and the other men of the valleys must have been furious at this betrayal, without William Pattinson telling Mr. Bowden then we wouldn't be able to pin down the location of this cave with any certainty. After Lanty was fined £100 for this crime, William Pattinson left the area, but nobody seems to know where he went to. The newspaper report states, 26th of March 1853, curious discovery of a cave for illicit distillation. A remarkable discovery of a cave containing an illicit still and all the appurtenances for the illegal manufacture of whiskey was made on the 12th by Mr. Bowden, officer of inland revenue of this town. The locale of this discovery was on the farm of Mr. Lancelot Slee, High Arnside, Colwith, Little Langdale, about five miles from Ambleside and six from Coniston. The secluded character of the place and the crafty concealment of the cave renders it a matter of some wonder how Mr. Bowden contrived to discover and find access to it. The cave has evidently been hollowed out entirely by labour. It is situated near the edge of a somewhat precipitous bank, the abrupt natural fall of one field of the farm into another. The access to it is not at the side, but perpendicularly through a hole at the surface, covered with a flat stone or flag. This aperture, which no doubt did the double duty of a chimney as well as a door, was covered carefully over with brackens. On descending, it was found that the sides and floor and roof of the cave were all flagged, the flags of the roof overlapping each other quite in a clever workmanlike style, so as to throw off the water towards the bank above mentioned. Strong posts and rafters made this subterranean retreat secure from any danger of falling in. The size of this underground apartment is about three or four yards long by two or three yards broad, and at the end, where the contraband work was transacted, a man could stand upright. The mode by which that indispensable requisite water was supplied for the distilling process formed part of the ingenious adaptation of the place. A little mountain rivulet was contrived by a small dam about 20 or 30 yards from the cave to aid in the illicit production of mountain dew. When it was wanted, the little stream found its way to the cave under a covering of turf and brackens, and having done its office, this Alpheus of the whisky still sank underground and reappeared about four or five yards from the cave like any ordinary drain. When not wanted for distilling, a stone just shifted at the dam turned it off into another field, as though for a simple purpose of irrigation. The cave contained all the equipment needed for distillation. An old boiler, crossed with bars of iron and mounted on stone, served as a fireplace, above which was the copper still, capable of containing 25 gallons with stillhead, worm and cooling tub. The bottom of the still and the condition of the bars show that the apparatus must have done a good deal of work. Besides these articles, there were found 27 gallons of wash in a state of fermentation, 2 gallons of ferment, a cask of treacle and 3 pints of whiskey, the produce of the still. There was a provision of cut wood for fuel, and though the operations were no doubt chiefly carried on in the long nights of winter, even if daylight had supervened, the thin light smoke might easily have escaped observation in so secluded a spot. Distant from any road except the occupation road to the farm, the cave is about a quarter of a mile from the farmhouse. No one was found at work at the still, but of course the articles were seized by Mr. Bowden, and the affair will form the subject of legal investigation. So, we went to find it. This dam was built in 1900, allegedly, as it's made from concrete blocks and cement. But I think there was an earlier dam here that matches the criteria in this article. After all, this entire region was modified and landscaped in the years after Lanty's death, 
creating the picturesque but human-friendly Tarn House, which is visited by tens of thousands of tourists each year. So it is possible they improved his dam when they made this change to the area. We do know that any spot discovered by the customs men was razed to the ground, so it's likely this lanty made hole was destroyed and what we see is actually the roof of the cave collapsed. Since this is National Trust land, you can't just dig it up to find out. You need some serious excavating gear just to even have a look. This is an artist's impression of Lanty inside his cave. Well, it's me in the small hole that remains, but hopefully you have an imagination. Am I certain this was Lanty's hiding spot? No, not 100%, but this is as close as anyone's ever got, I think. This locale matches all of the criteria for the dam, the cave and the outlet and distance from the farm. There's nowhere else in the vicinity that it could be. I know for certain as Ted and I have spent several days covering the area around it. Did we find the lost barrels of 150 year old whiskey? No, but that doesn't mean they don't exist, forgotten in some cool mineshaft somewhere. So old bloke in the pub who I met years ago. I 99% know this for certain to be one of Lanty's hiding spots, but I'm going to keep looking. The next time you're in the mountains, have a think about the smugglers who lived and worked here. The next time you drink whiskey, raise a glass in the memory of Lanty Slee, a smuggling legend of the Lake District. This is just one of the forgotten gems that I've unearthed in my research into smugglers and pirates. If you want more, let me know in the comments. Also, if you know anything new about Lanty Slee or want to collaborate with me, feel free to get in touch through my Twitter. And if you want to help me find the lost treasure of Lantis Lee and continue this adventure, then you can donate through my Patreon. If you liked this and want to see more, you know how YouTube works. Good luck, brave adventurers.